right, welcome back everyone to our special committee on uh, poverty. So this is a continuation from um, the committee meeting this morning. Uh, uh, this afternoon we have Mr. Mendelson here uh, from Maytree. Hello, Mr. Mendelson. Can you hear Hello. me all right? Yes. I can. Can you hear me all right? Yes, I can. So um, thank you so much for, for being here with us today. And again, similar to this morning, we will have um, uh, Mr. Mendelson will give his presentation. We'll save all questions until the end, just uh, mostly because it's easiest in terms of our um, uh, technical component to this meeting. Uh, and when we are asking questions, I will um, uh, um, uh, give your name, uh, the name of the person who's going to speak first uh, before uh, you ask your question, and then we'll flip back to Mr. Mendelson and so on and so forth, and we'll be you know, quite strict with that, which is a little uncomfortable, but is very helpful for um, to keep the flow going uh, for the uh, transmission uh, publicly. All right, any questions before we get started? All right, well, Mr. Mendelson, I will turn this over to you then. Thank you. Okay, okay. well, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to uh, do a presentation and to answer your questions this morning. It's uh, a real honor to uh, be able to do that. And uh, I hope that my contribution will be useful for your work. Uh, I, I've distributed a research paper that I wrote recently uh, for the Maytree uh, Foundation. Um, and uh, the paper, the purpose of the paper was to uh, try and extract some of the lessons uh, that uh, could be learned from Ontario's experience in setting up an experiment to uh, hopefully uh, uh, provide some uh, some good uh, ideas and uh, some of the pitfalls to avoid for any jurisdiction that might be considering doing something similar. And uh, this might be, so I, I hope that this might be very relevant for uh, what your committee is uh, undertaking. Uh, the uh, one of the issues around uh, a basic income experiment uh, is that um, there's a lot of there's so much interest and fervor and support for the idea of a basic income that it's very difficult to have a uh, disinterested and objective discussion. Uh, when Ontario announced its pilot initially, uh, for many advocates of the basic income and many of the groups that uh, are trying to find ways to reduce or eliminate poverty. The pilot wasn't seen so much as an experiment or a pilot. It was seen as the first stage in the implementation of a basic income for all Ontarians. So it was, uh, so any, any critical analysis of the experiment as an experiment was often seen as not uh, a question of is this well designed to provide evidence uh, uh, in answer to questions about a basic income, rather it was seen as a criticism of the basic income idea itself and wasn't welcome. What I've tried to do in this paper uh, is instead to be present a neutral uh, investigation of the uh, best way to establish an experiment based on the uh, lessons from Ontario, but also drawing from previous experiments that have been uh, set up in other jurisdictions, mainly in the, in the 1970s. Um, the, uh, the, the, in this paper, I focus on three specific issues with respect to the Ontario Basic Income Pilot, uh, in which I think that the experimental experimental design fell short. Uh, and the three issues, which I'll explain as I go on, are the lack of a sat true saturation site, the problems that Ontario experienced with enrollment, and um, the plan to use the income tax uh, system as the way to test recipients' income. Uh, I highlighted these three, income, these three uh, areas uh, because I think that they also presented an opportunity as well as, uh, as, as a challenge. And the opportunity uh, offered was to construct a different and perhaps uh, a much more unique and useful kind of experiment. So uh, let me start, first of all, just by uh, saying that I'm using the term basic income as a kind of generic term uh, for any program that provides an unconditional uh, 
periodic minimum cash guarantee uh, to uh, persons with low incomes or to actually, you could also have a universal program. Uh, the uh, the more common term that, that, that is used is guaranteed income. And in fact, the um, Ontario Basic Income Pilot, although it was called the Basic Income, was your guaranteed annual income designed as a negative income tax or an NIT. Uh, and the negative income tax is... Uh, the same design essentially as was used in the 19 in the experiments that were undertaken in the 1970s. I'm going to speak for a few minutes about what some of those experiments are, but first of all, I want to make a, a distinction, and that is uh, the Ontario Basic Income Pilot used the term pilot, uh, but it when I I, I was uh, engaged at various times with. Uh, with uh, the administration uh, in Ontario. And I, I asked one of the people, well, do you mean a pilot or an experiment? And he said, well, we don't know yet. But there is a difference between the two. Uh, a pilot is primarily a test of the administration of a program. How would you administer income tests? How would you uh, make the payments? What kind of reports would be required from the uh, of recipients and so on. Uh, an experiment is primarily a test of the outcomes of the program. What are the behavioral responses? Uh, will people uh, decrease their work effort? Uh, will teenagers be more likely to stay in or young adults be more likely to stay in school and so on? Uh, so there is a difference between a pilot or, and an experiment. But um, having said that, uh, an experiment can be both a pilot and an experiment at the same time, uh, but with two different focuses. Now, um, it's important to uh, look at some of what went uh, on previously. There were four basic income experiments undertaken in the United States and Canada in the 1970s. Um, most all of the North American basic income experiments had what are called randomized controlled trial components. Um, in a randomized controlled trial, subjects are randomly assigned either to a treatment group, um, and it could be multiple treatment groups, uh, or uh, to a control group, uh, which is kind of matched with the randomized group. And then we see what the difference is in the outcome uh, with respect to the control group and the randomized group. Uh, now, uh, that was done in all four experiments in, uh, in the 1970s, and the results were um, perhaps not what was anticipated. The results weren't anything very definitive, and for the most part, small, with a few exceptions. Um, there were decreases in the hours of employment among women and among uh, teenagers and young adults, uh, but there wasn't there was little or no decrease in the hours of employment among men. In fact, one of the experiments there was an increase in the hours of employment among men. Uh, the finding, most of, for 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 the most part, uh, the findings had little or no impact on on policy. Uh, the biggest impact was actually about, uh, as a result of a, a finding that was incidental to the focus on labor markets, and that was that in the American experiments. It was initially found that uh, the uh, rate of marriage dissolution was increased radically, and and this became a cause celebre and one of the reasons why the uh, experiments uh, were considered a failure in America. However, later analysis showed that uh, the uh, this finding might have been a result of a poor uh, analysis of the data, uh, which I think highlights uh, one of the importance, the importance of a, of a good research plan. But uh, by the time the experiments were uh, being completed, to the extent that they were completed, uh, interest in the, uh, in the uh, idea of a major reform of income security had, had faded, and the world went into a different kind of anti-recession mode. Um, so uh, the Canadian experiment, uh, which I'm going to talk about a little more uh, in a minute, was canceled. Actually, it wasn't canceled. It was uh, funding was uh, was allowed to run out. Uh, and I think you just heard from uh, Evelyn Forget this morning, so you probably know a lot about the income 
mink on uh, Manitoba experiment already. I'll, I'll be brief in my discussion of it. Um, the point about mink, uh, sorry, the the experiment in Canada, just in case you haven't been talked about it yet, was called mink on Manitoba, uh, formerly the Manitoba Basic Annual Income Experiment. Uh, and uh, it was different than any of the other experiments at one very, very critical respect. It had a saturation site uh, in addition to a randomized group of recipients. The difference is that in a, in a saturation site, everyone in a given location is eligible for the program, just, like, just as if it were a regular program and not a trial. Uh, in contrast, in a randomized trial, uh, recipients are scattered across uh, locations. Uh, there's, it's, it, it's, uh, there, you may not know of any uh, anybody else who's in the trial. Uh, your employer won't know that you're in the trial and so on. But in a saturation site, every resident has a guaranteed income floor, even though even, even those whose income is not currently low enough to qualify for a payment from the program. So what a saturation site allows us to do is to look at the effects of a basic income on everyone in a community, whether they're rich, whether they're poor, whether they're in between rich or poor, as well as the effects on the community as a whole. Uh, in Manitoba, as you probably heard from uh, Evelyn this morning, the saturation site was the town of Dauphin. Uh, it has a population or had a population of about 10,000. And the entire population of the town of Dauphin was eligible. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone in Dauphin got money, got a payment for income. What it does mean is that in Dauphin, if a household's income was uh, fell below the minimum amount, uh, where uh, below the guarantee level or uh, a little bit actually above that, as I'll explain later, they, they would be eligible for a payment. So uh, everyone was eligible, although not everyone got a payment at any given point in time. Uh, that meant that Minkum, for the time of the experiment, Minkum functioned in Dauphin as if a basic income uh, were being implemented in the, entire in the entire province. So it was possible to assess the effects of basic income on the whole community. Uh, now, Evelyn's paper uh, in 2011 was a, a very important paper in which he undertook an analysis of Mecham's impact in Dauphin uh, using administrative data from the health, uh, for health and, uh, and education system. Uh, obviously, you just heard about it, so I'm not going to go into, into it in any detail, except to say that it did show that there were impacts on uh, in the education system and, most uh, importantly, uh, in the uh, health system, and it was Evelyn's paper that sparked a significant renewed is interest in Canada in the concept of basic income. Uh, it also meant that we had to be aware that of the possibility that randomized controlled trials without a saturation site uh, might have missed important possibly positive implications for community as a whole. Uh, I'd say it was Evelyn's uh, uh, research that was uh, a very important factor in stimulating Ontario to uh, being in the OPIB. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to speak very uh, uh, generally about some of the key features in designing the OPIB because those features will be uh, have to be um, decided upon for any 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 uh, future experiment. Uh, so uh, the Ontario Basic Income Experiment was initiated by uh, commissioning a discussion paper by Hugh Siegel, and I think you've already heard from Hugh as well. And uh, there were uh, some of the key elements that were recommended by Hugh were. Uh, First of all, the amount of the basic income guarantee, that is, what is the level of income that people would be guaranteed? Uh, Siegel's report recommended uh, a guarantee of 70%, 75% of the low income measure. I won't go into detail about what that is, but it amounts to 37.5%, a little bit more than one third of medium income. 
And in Ontario, that was about $17,000 for a single person and $24,000 for a couple. Now, for a, a couple with children, they would also be getting the, uh, the uh, Canada Child Benefit. And also uh, Ontario Child Benefit, $1,400. So you, their actual income would be more than $24,000, depending on the number of children they had. Uh, Hugh Siegel also recommended an additional $66,000 uh, for uh, persons with disabilities. So one of the one of the all all the uh, amounts uh, for the basic income guarantee recommended by uh, Mr. Siegel were adopted by the Ontario government for the OPIB. Uh, the point here is that in any basic income experiment or negative income tax experiment or guaranteed income experiment, whatever you want to call it, one of the first issues that's going to have to be decided is what is the level of the uh, income that will be guaranteed. The second really important issue discussed in the Siegel report was the uh, income test. How do you go about testing income and what do we use to test the income of, uh, of families uh, or of households? Uh, the the uh, Siegel report recommended using the income tax system as the way to test the income of, uh, of households. Now, the thing about the income tax system is that as you all know, I'm sure, uh, it's paid, it's uh, calculated uh, for last year's income. So in uh, March or April, depending on how quick you are, you report the previous year's income, and it's only in June of the, uh, of the uh, year after income has been reported that the a Canada Revenue Agency finalizes the income tax reports. So that means that using income tax to test the income uh, of households will be uh, up to 18 months out of date. It'll also mean that there's a, uh, a, a given amount for a whole year that uh, is the family's uh, income that will establish their uh, benefit amount, and uh, that will be fixed for the year. So what happens if there's fluctuations in income during the year? What happens if income varies, as we know it does, and have to take account of that, and how will that be taken account of? I'm going to come back to that later. Uh, the third very important issue around in a negative income tax, basic income, whatever we're going to call it, is the reduction rate. That is, what is the rate at which uh, the uh, amount of payment that's made by the negative income tax decreases as the household's income increases. And um, there's a, a complicated, uh, well, maybe it's not complicated, but there's a bit of a formula here. If your guarantee, I'm just going to give an example, if your reduction rate is 50%, 50 that is, if there's 50 cents reduction in the level of the guarantee for every dollar that's earned, then that means that the amount of earning that you're going to have to have, or the amount of income you're going to have to have before all of the uh, payments from the negative income tax are gone will be double the amount of the basic income guarantee. Let me give an example. If Let's just say, I'm just going to use a number, let's just say that the basic income guarantee is $20,000. So that means that uh, if you have zero income, you'll get $20,000. But if you have $20,000 income, your benefit will be reduced by 50 cents for each dollar you've earned. In other words, $10,000. You'll still be getting $10,000 income from the negative income tax or the basic income. And therefore, you have to earn $40,000 before you get no payment at all from the basic income. In other words, double the amount of the guarantee. Now, if the uh, reduction rate is 25%, you have to earn four times as much as the uh, income guarantee before you don't get any payment. In other words, if there were a guarantee of $20,000, you'd have to earn $80,000 before all payments ceased uh, from, the, uh, from the negative income tax. So uh, we've got a trade-off here. 
the trade-off is the higher the reduction rate, the lower the cost of the experiment. There's fewer people who are getting payments, and uh, the payments are lower. But the lower the reduction rate, the greater the work incentive. 50% is a pretty high tax rate. Uh, 25% is the much lower tax rate, but it's also more expensive. Uh, now, the, uh, Mr. Siegel had a complicated set of, uh, of, uh, of recommendations to test a number of different reduction rates, but in the end of the day, the Ontario government uh, opted to test only a 50% reduction rate, uh, and that's what they went with. In considering the reduction rate, though, we also have to consider another important factor, and that is the uh, income tax rate. If someone is simultaneously paying income tax on their earnings, say they are a single person earning $20,000, then in Ontario they would be paying uh, 15% federal tax and 5% Ontario tax. In other words, 20% additional tax on their earned income. And that 20% adds on to whatever the reduction rate is that they're experiencing in the negative income tax. So it's 50% Say that the, uh, as in Ontario, the OPIB was 50% reduction rate. On top of that, there's a 20% tax rate. That means that the person earning $20,000 would effectively be experiencing a tax rate of 70%, which is pretty high. Uh, now, uh, the uh, Siegel report recommended that there be an adjustment to take account of the income tax, but this wasn't done of the income tax rates, but this wasn't done in Ontario. And again, I'll come back to that. Um, the uh, last factor that I want to mention is what is, I mean, it's obviously a very important factor, and that is what is the test population? Uh, Hugh Siegel recommended testing multiple NIT reduction rates and also a number of uh, randomized control trials and a number of saturation sites. In the end of the day, Ontario had uh, a randomized control trial sites in Hamilton and in Thunder Bay and a uh, targeted saturation site in Lindsay, Ontario. Uh, Lindsay is a town in Ontario of about uh, 10,000. Uh, population, it's the same as often. Um, but in fact, as I'll discuss later, Lindsay didn't uh, end up being a, a saturation site. The total, uh, the total targeted uh, participation in the experiment was to be 4,000 uh, people. So let me discuss, I'm a little concerned about going over time, but uh, I'll try and be a little shorter. Uh, the, uh, let me discuss the three critical issues, uh, if I can. First of all, the missing saturation site. As I mentioned, Lindsay was uh, discussed at the saturation site, but in fact, in Ontario, only those people who were entitled to a benefit at the time of enrollment in Lindsay were uh, uh, were eligible for the uh, for the OPIB. So once the enrollment period was over, that was it. If you were uh, you know, a young adult thinking about quitting your job and uh, using the guaranteed income to uh, start a business, for example, or go back to school, you weren't eligible because you weren't eligible in the first few months of the enrollment period. So it turned out that Lindsay wasn't a true saturation site. And um, it... Um, it meant it meant that we wouldn't be able to test the actual effects on a whole community in Lindsay as it was in Dauphin of the uh, of the effects of a, of a basic income. Uh, now uh, there's a lot of there's Evelyn's research that shows that there were important uh, effects on a whole community. But since Evelyn has done her work, she's inspired other researchers, and one in particular is work by David Kolnitsky. Uh, and David has uh, uh, used administrative data and actually has gone and gotten some of the old survey data and digitalized it uh, to look at community effects. And he too has found some important uh, effects in community in uh, Dauphin uh, for the whole community, one of which was, for example, a drop in, uh, in crime in property 
crime rates. Uh, another effect uh, on the other side was that wage, wage rates uh, in Dauphin did go up uh, compared to uh, compared to uh, other rural areas in in Manitoba at the time. Uh, what this what the research shows is that there are very important effects, possible effects uh, for basic income. Some might be positive, some might be negative, uh, but we will miss them if we only do a randomized uh, controlled trial. Uh, the uh, second issue is enrollment and randomization. Uh, now, as I say in my paper, uh, you might think it's easy to give away free money, but it isn't. It turns out that uh, the enrollment has been a difficulty, was very difficult in Ontario. Uh, and uh, in fact, the uh, initial enrollment plan uh, was a grand failure. And that was to mail out, uh, essentially mail out applications and have people uh, send in their replies. That didn't work. Ontario had to go to uh, recruiting through meetings and through social groups and networking. And uh, without going into the technicalities, this really uh, undermined the integrity of the ex of the uh, samples ex uh, of the experiment uh, from the point of view of the of the sample. Uh, the um, I would I should mention that Dauphin in Manitoba also had problems with enrollment. Uh, the uh, researchers estimated that only about one third of the eligible population in Dauphin also enrolled. Uh, so one of the lessons for uh, any other experiment is that the question of enrollment is really important and it has to be paid attention to. Uh, and even beyond uh, the enrollment of uh, working families who might otherwise not be involved in, in social programs is also the question of how do you reach more difficult families or more difficult individuals such as the homeless and, and so on. So how do we how do we target people who might not be uh, might be uh, sort of outside of most of uh, our major systems? Uh, the final uh, uh, issue in the uh, OPPIB that I want to uh, talk about is the question of how income was tested. I've already mentioned that the OPIB made the decision to use income tax to test income. So it was last year's income that would be looked at in order to set the amount of the uh, uh, payment that would be made to uh, households through the OPIB. Uh, and that meant that uh, the income could be significantly out of date. Uh, and Hugh Siegel recognized this in his report uh, and uh, recommended that a, uh, a mechanism be uh, implemented to account for fluctuations in income. And in fact, in the OPIB, there was a, an opportunity for people with, for, for recipients with a significant decline in income to report their decline. But there wasn't a good plan put in place or a coherent plan put in place to deal with the fluctuations. Just to put it in, in plain language, it was as if the uh, OPIB administration didn't realize that this was really an important and difficult, challenging issue. Now, in my view, it may be the case that it's possible to use the income tax system to test income. And if it is, that could be an important advantage for uh, a basic income, but uh, but in order to do that, there has to be a very clear and careful plan in place to deal with fluctuation in income and change in income. What do you do if somebody's income declines during the year? Also, what do you do if somebody's income goes up during the year? Do they have to make a repayment? Uh, and what does that what is what is involved in that? So I think that the opportunity here that was missed uh, in Ontario, one of the opportunities that was missed was the opportunity to test whether or not it would be possible to use the income tax system effectively to administer a, uh, a guaranteed income. Uh, now, uh, I want to just spend uh, one minute just saying that even if Ontario had addressed all these issues and 
We had the best possible design experiment. We also have to recognize that uh, any experiment is just that. It doesn't end up telling us what will happen for sure everywhere. And there are inherent limitations to a basic Higgin experiment. And I'm just going to mention uh, three that are, are critically important. The first is that, uh, as I say, humans aren't molecules. Uh, they don't necessarily, you you know, uh, uh, um, respond to uh, the same stimulus in the same way uh, each time uh, it's applied. Uh, behavioral responses to a basic income could change over time. It can change due to general social attitudes. It can change if the economic context changes, if there's inflation, if there's high unemployment, uh, and so on. So it's very difficult to extrapolate uh, any findings from an experiment over time or over societies or even over geographic areas. Another big limitation of an experiment is that it's time limited. And that means that people only react uh, to it uh, in in anticipation of it being available for a limited period of time, only for three years or four years or whatever the length of the experience is. Uh, the experiment is. It also means uh, that uh, for those reactions to a basic income that would take a longer period of time to to be uh, to be to be seen uh, we just won't see those if it takes 10 years for the uh, employers to respond fully to uh, adjustments in wages we won't see that in a, in a limited period of time and if an experiment uh, for example only takes three years another very a third very important inherent limitation uh, and one that has been discussed is that is around the uh, how do you pay for a basic income. Uh, if you're going to put in a basic income that has a significant uh, uh, income guarantee uh, beyond the uh, amounts that are paid in welfare, it's going to be expensive. And it's also going to interact with the tax system in ways that I've discussed. So we have to think about how we adjust the tax system we don't have additive marginal ra rates of taxation that are very high, 70, 75 percent, 80 percent. But we also have to think about how to raise the money to pay for the basic income program. And of course, in an experiment, it's very difficult to adjust the tax system to insulate specific, uh, to, to insulate recipients from the effect of the tax system. But it's completely impossible to uh, raise the tax rates of individuals who are or a single community that's engaged in the experiment uh, just to uh, to to reflect what would happen in a in a, if a basic income was actually uh, implemented uh, in a uh, in a whole province or in a whole country. Uh, so we have to be aware that uh, there are limitations to a basic income experiment. And I'd say that for that reason, we should focus as much on the administrative issues in setting up any experiment as we do on the behavioral issues. In the past, administrative issues have played very little, uh, have had very little attention compared uh, to behavioral issues. Uh, so in other words, as much a pilot project as a as an experiment. So just to conclude, um, one thing we have to be aware of is that there's a, you know, given the interest in basic income, almost any project that could possibly be called a basic income experiment gets incredible attention. I point out in my uh, in my paper the Finnish basic income experiment got has nine over nine million Google uh, result results from a Google search. Uh, but the finished experiment, if you look into it in detail, wasn't actually a basic income experiment. It was uh, it was uh, an unconditional payment of uh, unemployment benefits to a group who otherwise would have been collecting uh, conditional unemployment benefits. And the same can be said about many other so-called basic income experiments around the world. I I don't I wouldn't want to see PEI simply being another. Uh, publicity gathering, but not evidence gathering, uh, 
jurisdiction. Um, another issue uh, uh, is that um, any experiment is likely to require more than a single term of government. And in fact, if you are going to undertake something like an experiment in PEI, it's probably going to take you a couple of years at least to set up the experiment. And that means that you're going to overlap uh, an election. In other words, another term of government. And in fact, in both Manitoba and in Ontario, the experiments were cancelled uh, sort of midstream uh, because of the uh, change in government. So I think we need to realize that an experiment is going to overlap term of government, and we have to uh, think about ways to insulate the um, the experiment from that reality uh, by setting up, I would say, third party uh, endowed. Uh, uh, implementation. Uh, finally, uh, in, in terms of substantive points, I think the most important point is that you must have a saturation site. Uh, what I would hope not to see is another uh, so-called basic income experiment where, I don't know, a few hundred families get a thousand dollars a month each and uh, and we see what happens. I don't think that that would add any anything to the knowledge or evidence we have about a basic income. Uh, and uh, a saturation site is, to me, uh, absolutely necessary if we're going to understand what the effects are on a community as a whole, both the positive and the, and the negative. Um, so I, I think that there's two different types of basic income experiments that are possible. One is... Uh, a sort of full-fledged saturation site. Uh, I would I would like to see an experiment set up where the whole population of a town or a community is automatically enrolled, and uh, of course they're allowed to opt out. So it's sort of an opt out rather than an opt in. So you have a whole community uh, engaged. Uh, the other would be to distinguish between. On the one hand, we have the income guarantees in uh, basic income. Uh, on the other hand, one of the, the uh, distinctions of uh, negative income tax or basic income from our existing system is that the payments are unconditional. They're simply in a negative income tax based on income. You don't have to prove anything about what you're doing or not doing to get an income. We, could, we don't know. We have in our current welfare system uh, I'm not sure what exists at PEI on the island, but in every province, and I expect PEI is no exception, there are uh, significant sticks, penalties, uh, and enforcement uh, personnel involved in ensuring that any person on social assistance is engaged in employment, in employment search, or in training, and uh, with, with uh, uh, penalties and uh, associated with not being engaged in that kind of activity. That's called conditionality. The difference between a basic income and the, our welfare is that uh, basic income is unconditional. Now, we don't really know, and there's, as far as I know, there's never been a test of whether these penalties and enforcement mechanisms and policing in social assistance, whether they're really effective. Uh, would uh, an unconditional program where all the uh, energy and expense of enforcement was instead used as a carrot as a, to support people searching for employment, would that instead be more effective in, uh, in uh, having people who would otherwise be on social assistance become employed or go to training? We don't know the answer to that. So one possible experiment that would be uh, much less expensive would be simply to take the existing welfare system, uh, maybe adjust rates a little bit, but not too much, and make that unconditional for a period of time, say three years, and see what the effect is. Um, and that would be a relatively inexpensive, uh, inexpensive uh, uh, opportunity to test to test uh, one of the key aspects of basic income. So finally, uh, I have uh, on the uh, last page of my uh, of my report, uh, 
uh, five recommendations for how to do an experiment. And um, I think that they, they might be useful to reflect on. One is to think carefully about the questions that you want to answer. What is it that you want to gather evidence about? Secondly, to consult widely and thoroughly about how to design an experiment. Thirdly, uh, to field test the experiment. This is something that wasn't done in Manitoba and it wasn't done in Ontario. And uh, I think it absolutely must be done if you're going to come up with a, uh, a realistic budget and a realistic plan for timing and implementation. Uh, finally, I'd say uh, after you have tested the design, establish a realistic budget timeline, and then assign it to a third party to carry out the, uh, the actual uh, experiment in a way that insulates the uh, experiment from political uh, considerations for the time being. So thank you very much. Uh, that's the summary of a report. I, I hope you've had a chance to take a look at it yourself, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. And I'm sorry for taking a little more time than I ought to have. Oh, thank you so much, Mr. Mendelssohn. That was uh, incredibly uh, informative. You've really given us uh, uh, some clear uh, things that we need to consider uh, moving forward. And I, I uh, will uh, take a moment now, actually, before we open the floor to questions, just to acknowledge a couple of uh, folks in the gallery who've been uh, with us since the beginning today. So we have Roxanne Carter-Thompson, who has been involved with the Poverty Reduction Council, among other things. And we have Mary Boyd here with us today, um, who has been very active around poverty elimination initiatives across the island for many years. So I just wanted to take a minute to acknowledge them and thank them for being here today. Um, so I will now open the floor to questions. Who would like to go first? Annabelle? Sure. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mr. Mendelssohn, and uh, thank you, Chair. Um, there's, it's, it's interesting to see um, you know, analysis. I think there's there's obviously some key players from the research perspective in here who all know each other. We've managed, I think, to talk to some big names, and it's really great to sort of have have you adding to that. And there, there's some common themes that are coming forward. Um, I, I really think it's interesting to to have the differentiation between pilot and experiment um, because um, that that qualification is important, certainly for me personally, because. You're right. Like, like we do tend to think about a pilot as being, the, you know, this chance to try something else out. But, but as we heard from Dr. Forger this morning, we need to understand that when you're experimenting, um, you are testing, and you need to be really clear on what it is you're testing for. When you talked about at the end there, you were just talking about, you know, one of the, th the considerations is what happens if we make existing welfare systems mm -hmm. unconditional. Um, I'd be interested to hear from you. Do you feel that that's sort of a starting point? Is what question are we trying to answer is one of those starting points, that disconnection of, of income to employment? Mr. Mendelssohn. Uh, yeah, I, I think that that's one of the, uh, I mean, the, the sort of core of, a, of, a, of, of basic income, however it's designed, and there, as you probably already know, many multiple ways, many, many ways of designing a basic income guarantee. But there's two core uh, elements to it. One is the amounts of the guarantee, the reduction rates and so on. How do you structure the design? But the other is that it's unconditional, that it goes out to people based either on their income or you know the size of their family or whatever those criteria are, but it goes out automatically. And it doesn't matter what you do or don't do you'll get that, it's, it's unconditionality. Uh, the, our welfare system does provide, uh, in Canada, we have a social assistance system and it does provide some level of assistance to at least meet, meet the uh, basic necessities of life, but it is conditional. And uh, what we haven't tested uh, in, uh, in, uh, about welfare is whether that conditionality is useful. Uh, in my experience, I've been involved in social policy for about 50 years, and in my view, uh, the conditionality might might have a reverse effect. It sort of forces people to prove that they're unemployable. Uh, and people are uh, being people, human beings being human beings. If you feel you have to prove you're unemployable, then sure enough, you start to think of yourself as unemployable. And I'm not sure, I mean, the conditionality might 
uh, have the result of encouraging some additional people who otherwise wouldn't have to become employed. But at the same time, it might have the effect of encouraging some people who might be employable to think of themselves as unemployable. We don't know which one is more. We don't know if the conditionality and the time and expense and the stigma associated with conditionality is actually having any any positive effect at all. And uh, as far as I know, that's never been the subject of an experiment. Uh, so the aspect of, uh, of, uh, of a guaranteed income that we could feasibly test that wouldn't be that expensive to test would be to test unconditionality or conditionality by providing an un- by taking our current welfare system and making it unconditional. Um, just to say the big expense, now the Ontario OPPIB was quite expensive, but the expense was the uh, significant increase in, uh, in the guarantee level uh, above, and beyond, above and beyond welfare. Uh, we have uh, three aspects of, of cost. We have the actual administrative cost of a basic income. We have uh, the research costs of a basic experiment, and we have the cost of the uh, of the um, guaranteed income. But against that, we have the savings in welfare, and the big the big increase in cost in Ontario, and what made it a very expensive uh, a very expensive experiment was that the level of the uh, of the basic income guarantee uh, was was significantly higher than than welfare uh, so given that uh, the uh, federal government is not going to be a participant with PEI and given PEI's uh, limited resources may be an opportunity to make a real contribution to understanding the possibility of a basic income would be to attempt to uh, to do an experiment where the main issue being uh, looked at is the effect of conditionality. Hannah Bell. Thank you, uh, Chair. Mr. Mendelson, you've just made my day. <laughs> Thank you for, uh, for for being so clear in um, in that it is um, it is an ongoing challenge with the social assistance systems. Um, that they are exactly that based on on having to continually demonstrate um, and therefore be placed continually in that situation of of needing to sort of um, demonstrate need which is which is for people who are already in a situation of of great um, challenge uh, you know really I think yeah really I think it's a really interesting point that we're talking about how important it is to collect data and understand why but we have these entire systems that are that are not necessarily based on any um, evidence. any evidence um, and and certainly the anecdotal experience for people who um, who are in poverty and inside that system supports what you're saying which is that this actually does not achieve what um, um, any positive outcomes in terms of, of their mental health and their perception of, of where they fit in society. You know, we, we've talked as well about that many people on social assistance um, are unable to work and enter the workforce because of a disability, whatever that may be. Um, and so that's yet another layer of, of, um, of challenge of asking people to step up, step up to meet conditions that they are never able to meet. Um, and so I, I really appreciate um, that qualification. I know that, you know, we've talked a bit earlier with Dr. Forget about, about how we want to, you know, we want to do the whole thing. We want the Cadillac version, but we also need to be pragmatic about, about what is within our capacity fiscally and about where you can achieve tangible outcomes in the scope of what you can do, um, you know, legislatively and, 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 and policy-based. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there is, there is still a really important shift that could happen there w- by looking at conditionality as, as, a, as, a, as a core presumption of is this coming from somewhere from evidence. So, so thank you so much for that. Um, I guess this also connects to my other question that I had for you, um, which is just around that, that randomized recruitment. Um, and taking into consideration that there are 
um, different populations that have very specific needs and how can yeah. you, within a randomized test, how can you make sure you are reflecting an appropriate number of people who have very specific needs that could be quite different from others, i.e. people with disabilities? Mr. Yeah, and, and, and people who are homeless, etc. And that's not, as far as I know, um, reaching the hard to reach uh, hasn't been one of the uh, sort of core uh, goals of the uh, of, of any of the uh, experiments in the past and or any of the sort of quasi things that are called basic income uh, around the world uh, as far as I know right now um, so I think that that would be uh, that sort of that's more of a pilot issue if I can call it that than a than an experimental issue it's how would you administer a, a program to to reach the hard to reach and to uh, if you have a disability uh, uh, additional amount, uh, how do you ensure that people are able to access that, uh, who ha are, are people with disabilities uh, in, a, in a fair way? Uh, and uh, all those kinds of all those kinds of questions I think would be uh, would be quite important. Um, Annabelle. Thank you, Chair. Just a, a comment on that, Mr. Mendelson, is, is that um, you know that one of the great advantages we have in, the, in PEI is, is a very well-connected community um, and with incredible um, community-based organizations who have been engaged in, in, in this work and in work with those communities. So I think it's a real positive thing that we can bring forward in our considerations here is, is how much um, opportunity there is to reach populations that in other areas may not be as contactable because we can go directly to community partners who know where they are. Um, and okay. so that, that's a real potential opportunity for us to sort of, again, add something into the story that we could do here that hasn't been able to be achieved elsewhere. It is. Mr. Mendelson, is there anything you wanted to add uh, to what uh, Hannah just said? No, but I, I'm just concerned about your time and I'm, that I'm taking too much of your time. Uh, are, we, are, we, uh, are we okay time-wise or are we... Oh yes, it's it's fine. We're um, okay. we're all okay. here and we're committed to seeing this through. So don't worry. We'll take as much time as it as it takes. Okay. All right. Um, uh, would anybody else like to ask a, a question? Uh, Ernie Hudson. Yes, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you uh, very much for your presentation. Uh, just uh, a couple of questions that I would have here. Uh, and I've been asking this, I guess, for the last uh, two or three presenters, groups that have presented. But we've heard sort of uh, two different opinions of whether uh, initially uh, if and when the province goes down this road of a basic income guarantee, do we look at it as... Uh, uh, a pilot slash experiment, or should right from the get-go, would it be best to look at it as policy, as a permanent fixture? So I would like your opinion on that. All right, Mr. Mendelson. Well, I'm going to, uh, maybe I'll disappoint someone, but I, I, I would like to see a pilot or an experiment. Um, I'd like to see an experiment that is also <laughs> has a significant focus on, on, on administration, so it would be a combined experiment and pilot. Uh, I, I, this would be a, a very major reform of our income security system, uh, and have a significant impact on on our on society. And I think it would be reasonable to have some evidence as to its workability within the inherent limitations that I mentioned of a of an experiment. Uh, I, I, it's not. I mean, it would be. Uh, I don't think it would be unreasonable to say, well, we, you could do a pretty radical experiment in PEI because it's a smaller province. You have opportunities. If you if you experimented with non-conditionality uh, in making your welfare system unconditional, it would be possible, I think, and fiscally uh, reachable to uh, do that for a whole province for three years and see what the implications are. And you would have very significant evidence uh, then gathered about the issue of unconditionality, or uh, in uh, for for future implementation of a of a, a more substantial uh, guarantee level than is currently in social assistance, even if you adjust the social assistance uh, a bit. Um, so, so I I suppose I I I think jumping to uh, to implementation isn't 
necessarily the right thing to do. Um, another aspect I'd say that I'd really like to understand that I think would be useful, if we could use the income tax system to test uh, income, and uh, if the issue of fluctuation of income could be handled in a simple, straightforward way uh, that wouldn't engage too much administrative uh too much bureaucracy that wouldn't require too much bureaucracy then that would be a, a great uh that would be a real benefit to the possibility a, a real it would show that a, a basic income a negative income tax is a lot more a lot more possible and could be delivered in a way that with a lot less stigma and maybe no stigma as we've seen with things like the child benefit uh, so i i think that testing some of the key elements uh, of a basic income is really important uh, to understand how it could be done. Uh, and I'd, I'd like to see that being, I would like to see a, a, a combined pilot and experiment. And I hope the, I would take that opportunity. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Uh, if uh, the province, if we do get down the road, of a basic income guarantee with complete saturation over, uh, you know, whether it's a three, four, or five year period on a pilot slash uh, experiment. Do you have concerns if at the end of the day, for whatever reason, that it is not continued on and uh, the province government of the day reverts back to uh, a similar system of uh, socialist system, uh, social assistance, uh, other types of supports. Uh, do you have concerns with that taking place? Yeah, well, every, every yes, I mean, every transition is difficult. Uh, and I think one of the, if I, uh, I try to be neutral in my, uh, in my, in my research report, but I, I do think it was wrong for the Ontario government to cancel uh, benefits to people after a promise had been made, albeit by a different government, uh, to continue those payments for three years. Uh, but, you know, having said that, I think that if the uh, Prince Edward Island government uh, and legislature made it clear to people, these are this is what we're doing, it's got a X number of year periods, it will be, we will assess it after the end of that uh, time, and uh, depending upon the assessment, we'll implement some of the reforms, uh, all of the reforms, or maybe none of the reforms. Uh, that will depend upon what the findings are. I think that that would be a fair, uh, a fair, fair, and it would be fair to, to people if they understand ahead of time uh, what was the what the promise was, and if that promise were kept. Uh, and of course, there'd also be an opportunity for the ultimate test, which is. Uh, vote <laughs> in the the peop people could always vote in a government with another another uh, another you know another policy. So I think it would be possible to do, but you know every transition involves 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 difficulty, and of course it wouldn't be you know without a few bumps in the road, but but possible. All right, uh, Ernie Hudson, one more question. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, with the size of uh, the population on PEI, if we did go with uh, complete saturation right across the board, uh, would you see the population of 160,000 or thereabouts being too large or just uh, an ideal population size to do a pilot slash experiment? Mr. Mendelson? Well, if, if you had an infinite amount of money, it would be ideal, uh, and if you if you wanted to do a full you know design with uh, with the kind of levels of guarantee that were in the uh, Ontario Basic Income Pilot, which were uh, I wouldn't say they were overly generous by any means, but they were certainly reasonable and they were a substantial improvement for especially for individuals. Uh, uh, over and above what is now available on on social assistance, if you wanted to do that, it would be very uh, expensive for PEI, and I expect it would be outside of the bounds of your possibility. Now, if the federal government would participate, there might be a real opportunity here, given that you know PEI is a relatively small province and it's a defined geographic area. We might have an opportunity to do something that's sort of you know world that would be. 
uh, you know, unique and new and 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 fantastic for the whole world. But having said that, it would be about ten times the size of any previous experiment, as far as I know. Um, and uh, it would be, I think, very difficult for PI to do a province-wide full basic income experiment, which is why I was talking about the possibility of doing a full province-wide. I think you could do a full province-wide experiment that simply had minor adjustments to the social assistance rates, but uh, did it uh, uh, experimented with, non with, with having an unconditional welfare system, which encourages employment rather than enforces uh, employment. I think that that might be uh, that, that I, you know, I haven't obviously looked at the costs and so on, but I think that might be within the range of, of uh, fiscal feasibility for PI to undertake on its own. Uh, just adding a last comment, if I can. I, I don't know enough about the geography and the demography of PI to know whether there could be a, a saturation site that's just part of the island. I mean, the island is basically, I've been there to your beautiful island many times, several times, and it's wonderful. It seems to me, though, that everywhere is accessible, as far as I know. And it's hard. It's hard for me to. I don't, maybe there is a way to have an isolated area of fifteen thousand population, but I'm not sure that that is feasible as it was in in Manitoba. Um, I, I just don't. I just don't know. Uh, Mr. Mendelson, I just wanted to uh, to ask. Uh, no, I realize I was quite quick to say we're all here for as long as needed. But uh, do you, is it, are you able to continue on with questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. Go into this thing. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. All right, uh, Gordon McNeely. Yes, thank you very much. Um, that's uh, just to continue on. I just have a couple of questions. Just to continue on with our thoughts, uh, Prince Edward Island. Uh, I have written down too. We're 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 kind of divided up into to three specific areas. And and um, as you're speaking, I was ta thinking about a urban versus rural kind of context when we're thinking about Prince Edward Island for a saturation point. So that was my kind of my question was, do you think it would work where, I mean, we, I mean in, in and do we need that kind of controlled perfect population group to, to, to get a good saturation site? Mr. Madison. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a, that's a really difficult question. Um, you're going to have peculiar characteristics of, uh, of, of any saturation site. Um, you know, Dauphin was a rural economy uh, in uh, in Manitoba. It did not reflect, if I if I can say it, you know, did not reflect the economy in Winnipeg, Manitoba, uh, which was uh, much more urban and you know a much more manufacturing base and and so on. Uh, so whatever you pick is going to have peculiar characteristics that will be if you do pick a uh, an area that will be um, it'll be limiting to a certain extent, uh, whatever you pick. So it's a, it's a difficulty. Um, and from the rest of, from the perspective of, you know, downtown Toronto, where I live, anywhere in PI will be relatively rural. Uh, so it'll be that extrapolating uh, to a place like Ontario, like Toronto or Vancouver or Ottawa will be, you know, you'll have to make assumptions about what's ex what can be extrapolated. In fact, that's one of the points I made in my uh, in my presentation and in the paper about the inherent limitations of an experiment, and that is you have to accept that it is going to be very difficult to extrapolate across uh, economies, across societies, across time. Things change, uh, so. My only advice would be that uh, it would have to be a little bit based on serendipity. Uh, what what is possible? Is there an area of, out of your three areas? Is there one of the areas that would be, you know, a small enough population so that it would be feasible to implement a full sort of full fledged experiment, uh, and uh, and so on. So, uh, but accept the limitations of that. Yeah. Gordon McNeely. And uh, just my final question. Uh, thank you uh, in advance uh, for joining us. Um, I look at um, uh, the landscape of our country and uh, specifically to 
you know, BC, they've got a more or less a left-leaning coalition government. Um, uh, you know, our, our country just decided to go with a minority government and uh, we are here too in a minority government situation. Do you think, and is, is, there, is there any other jurisdictions in Canada, like I would think that British Columbia would have enough time right now to, to look at something like this. I guess I'm looking for potentially a sister uh, a sister location across the country um, to you know to take this approach you know maybe with us something on the west coast is there anything out there uh, the last little while that you can uh, talk to us about Mr. well there is uh, BC has set up a panel um, uh, as you know it's a coalition it's not really coalition it's an agreement and maybe it is a coalition I'm not sure what it is formally with the Green Party and the NDP and uh, the uh, they have set up a panel on uh, on on uh, on a basic income to sort of think about what the, as far as I can tell what the next steps are. I refer actually to the website in my uh, the, in the uh, in in my paper, uh, and it might be useful to look at it. Uh, as far as I know, I, I'm actually doing some work with the uh, the BC panel uh, on uh, on the uh, on this issue and. Uh, um, I'm attending a workshop there in uh, in December. Um, so there, uh, on both sides of the, there's a lot of geography <laughs> separating BEI and and BC, but there is something going on on both sides of the uh, of the continent, and it, it might be useful to to try and make some some connection. Um, I, I actually was talking to a few people from BC who were involved in their in the panel and and uh, told them about PEI. They didn't know about what was going on in PEI either, so uh, so they were interested as well. Oh yeah, thank you, very, thank you very much. And uh, just just um, you know, your final thoughts on uh, is this minority government uh, uh, federally something that can potentially help um, our plight here? I, I have no idea. Uh, it would be great if the uh, federal government would would, would uh, become a partner, and you could uh, and you could do something that would uh, uh, be a little, you know, uh, well, would cost more money, obviously, uh, and um, that would be, I think, really useful. Uh, but uh, I, I don't know. I'm not sure what the uh, what the federal. I have no idea, actually. <laughs> you probably you're the politician. You probably have a better idea than than I, than I do. But I think that there could be some some useful useful work done if they would uh, if they would if they would partner. Thank you, uh, Natalie Jameson. Great, thanks. Thanks very much for joining us today. I guess that question was a good segue into into my question here. Um, so, what uh, what practical limitations would there be on a pilot that involves only one level of government, um, given programming that involves obviously multiple levels of government? Mm -hmm. Mr. Mendelson. Yeah. So, uh, okay. Well, that's a different question, and that's that's one that has to be thought through. Uh, very, you know, it has to be thought, it's kind of question that it can only be answered in detail and not in generality, but there's issues like the overlap with a, um, with the tax system. In my paper, I go into it in some detail. Uh, in, in one of the issues of the overlap with the tax system is how do you, what do you do exactly? In, in the Manitoba experiment in Minka, Manitoba in the 1970s, they actually, any person who was uh, in an eligible range of income got a tax refund that paid them back for the full amount of federal and provincial income tax that they had paid uh, so, that they, so that there were actually two payments involved in the Manitoba basic income experiment. There was the basic income payment itself, but there was also the tax refund to compensate for any income tax that had been paid. And for technical reasons, that went not only to the level, to people whose income was at the level of the basic income, but also to everyone who was entitled to any level of payment. So that was, as I was explaining earlier, 50% uh, reduction rate meant that everybody would double the level of um, of, uh, of income beyond the basic income guarantee got a tax refund as well as a, as a income payment. 
and actually it actually went even above that level for <clears throat> for technical reasons I don't want to go into now but I discussed in my paper so um, there are many other issues that would have to be looked at in detail I, is it I mean sort of try and answer your question specifically yes I think it is possible for a jurisdiction on its own to set up a useful pilot and uh, uh, or pilot or experiment combined. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but but it, it's the kind of thing that has to be thought through very carefully. Uh, and in, if I could just be explicit, I don't think it was thought through carefully enough in Ontario. I think the uh, project was hurried along a little too rapidly. And as a result, many issues like the overlap with the income tax system just weren't weren't addressed adequately. Kelly Jameson. Yeah, great, thank you, Chair. And, and thanks for your response there on that one. Um, and I know this question has been asked to, to previous presenters, but I'd like to get your take on it, and it's, it's somewhat twofold as well, but um, assuming a province-wide implementation, what impact do you believe a uh, basic income guarantee would have on the rate of both inflation and uh, immigration? Mm -hmm. Mr. Mendelson. Uh, you know, I'm going to tell you, say, give you an answer that's probably not going to be satisfactory. I don't think it would have any impact on, on inflation. Uh, uh, I might be wrong about that. Um, I don't know. Uh, uh, because, uh, well, it depends upon the goods. It might have a, a, a slight impact on the price of uh, some of the services that are local only, like restaurant and uh and that kind of restaurants and that kind of thing. But of course, in, you know, prices that are set nationally or even internationally, it's not going to have any impact on inflation. Um, the, uh, I, I, uh, I don't think it would have any impact on immigration either. It depends upon what the rules are. Uh, if you, uh, you'd have to think about rules in, in, in uh, Lindsay, Ontario, uh, in Ontario, you had to be resident in Lindsay for the ye whole year prior to the uh, year of the uh, of the implementation of the experiment. So, with that kind of uh, rule, even if it had been a true saturation site, it didn't uh, provide an incentive for people to move into Lindsay to take advantage of the experiment. But my real answer to your question, if I can would be this. Uh, it would be that this is an experiment. And one of the things we want to understand in an experiment is what are the consequences? Some of the consequences we can't um, know ahead of time. We could speculate, as I was just doing. Uh, but one of, the th one of the things we want to do in an experiment is to be able to answer questions like yours. What would be the effect on inflation? And ultimately, the only way to answer that is to try... Uh, an experiment to, to try and gather some evidence. Um, if you, 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 whoever was, to, if you did a province-wide or even a local experiment uh, in uh, in PEI, and you wanted to understand the impact on immigration, <clears throat> you'd have to design the experiment to allow people to uh, who are immigrating to become part of the experiment. Or you could do the reverse. You could decide that you weren't interested in that question and uh, you wanted to do as they did in Ontario and limit the, uh, the implementation of the experiment. So uh, I'd start with the uh, first point I made in my summary of the five points, and that is what questions do you want to answer? And uh, if one of the questions are is about immigration, then you'll have to think about setting up your experiment in such a way as to give you some evidence on that on that very question. Uh, inflation, I think, is a much more difficult question because it's such a general uh, phenomena. You know, it'll be affected by interest rates set by the Bank of Canada, by international exchange rates, and who knows what else. I, I don't know what else. So it'd be very difficult to isolate the effects of the experiment and I think if you if you sat down and said that's one of the questions I want to answer 
and you consulted with experts, they might come back to you and say, sorry, you can't design an experiment that's going to answer that question. It's uh, not possible. You maybe have to do it in the whole country to answer that question. So so one of the benefits, so I'm just going to try and <laughs> finish this answer. One of the benefits of doing an experiment is to answer to try and provide some evidence, it won't be definitive, but some evidence to answer questions. And one of the first things you want to do is to ask yourself what questions you want to answer. You've outlined two questions, immigration and inflation. You want to then ask people, well, how can I design an experiment to answer these questions, to provide some evidence towards answering these questions? And the experts might come back and say, here's our advice. Uh, have a rule that limits it so that uh, you have to have prior residence or not. Or experts might come back and say, sorry, it can't be done. We can't can't design a, a decent experiment to answer this particular question. Okay, great, thank, thank you. you. Uh, Natalie, is that? Yeah. That's great, thank All you right, very much. Ernie Hudson. Yes, thank you, Chair, and uh, just uh, uh, more of a comment and then a very quick question. Uh, I think we're a very optimistic group here, so with that, uh, there is optimism that, uh, that the federal government, I think, would partner. Time will tell on that, but uh, we'll certainly be, uh, be pushing for that. Uh, with regard to the reduction rate, a uh, quick question, like I say, uh, reduction rate based on net or gross earnings? Well, in, in Ontario, it was based on the uh, taxable family income. I can't remember which income tax line it was. I could look it up uh, at a later date. Uh, and that was uh, it's it's net of it's it it was it was net of some of the deductions, but not all of them. And one of the Again, one of the issues that I, I'm, I'm going to give you a really unsatisfactory answer, and my answer is, well, which one do you want uh, to test? And the, uh, the question uh, then is, uh, how do you go about setting up an income test to reflect what income you think is important? One of the issues in using the income tax system to test income is that some uh, income isn't even reportable. Uh, like I think... Uh, Repayments of capital in a, if you buy a, uh, if you invest in real estate and you're getting initial distributions, uh, those distributions aren't reportable because they're treated as repayment of capital. Well, should they be treated as income or not? Uh, also, another question, uh, getting a little bit off your uh, comment, in Manitoba, a income experiment, wealth was taken into account as well as income. Um, and I, I don't remember the exact details, but there was uh, people had to account for their the the amount of assets they had as well as the uh, amount of income, and that was taken into account in the system. So um, one of the in setting up a pilot, you're going to have to think through the answer to your to your question. It's an open <coughs> it's an open question, and it depends upon what you what you want to test. So I, I don't have an answer. There's no preset answer. The, the preset, the, the, the answer is it could be either. You could have it as a, there's way, many different ways of having a, a gross income. You can have adjusted gross income and so on and so forth. There's many different ways of having net income. You can have, you know, what do you net, what you don't net. Uh, there's many different ways that you can take into account wealth or not take into account wealth. And those are questions that need to be thought through. Uh, and again, I would say in Ontario, if I if I may say so, and be slightly critical, because of the uh, haste with which the experiment was set up, I think some of these issues weren't thought through uh, carefully enough. Uh, I think Hugh Siegel did a great job, but you know he had very limited amounts of time and limited expertise uh, available to him. And uh, I think it would do well to think through these questions carefully ahead of time. It's a good question. Thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions? Oh, Ola. Uh, my question relates to reduction rates and uh, the very happy finding that previous studies have shown that uh, that getting the money doesn't reduce people's desire to work, which is a really good news. Uh, what I was wondering, is there any feedback that you have from these studies that you can put into the existing systems like social assistance 
particularly relating to jobs, which where in social assistance, the reduction rate is like uh, basically if you earn some money, you they take it right away. You basically can't earn any money. I think is more or less a system. Is there something we can learn? Learn in the social assistance system to, that would make it better, or maybe Mr. even get to the point where we don't need to speak about guaranteed income. Mr. Mendelson. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Um, I'm I should have uh, looked at the PI uh, social assistance system before before I uh, appeared here, uh, and I didn't. Most of the, uh, I think almost all of the provinces now uh, don't take away a dollar of benefits for each dollar you earn. In Ontario right now, uh, the first $200 of earning is exempt, $200 a month uh, for people who are on what's called Ontario Works. Uh, and uh, then the reduction rate is 50 cents for each, each dollar of earning. So there is a a $200 exemption and then 50% uh, reduction rate. And I I don't know what it is in in, uh, in uh, PEI, but I expect that there's some kind of uh, system like that. If you did do uh, the experiment that I was uh, suggesting of um, simply introducing a non-conditional, on making your, uh, social, your, your social assistance system non-conditional, You'd have to ensure that there were uh, uh, an earning in incentive, if there isn't one now in the PEI system, like that in the welfare system. So you can certainly put that into place in the in the welfare system if it isn't in place in EI right now, but it is in place in most provinces. And I'm just going to tell you my anecdotal experience. As I've said, I I start I actually was a graduate student. Uh, working in summer uh, in for the Minkum project in the 1970s in Manitoba, which tells you how old I am and uh, how long I've been involved in social policy and, and fiscal policy uh, in Canada. My anecdotal experience is that, you know, 95% of the people on assistance want jobs desperately. Uh, there might be, you know, there, there always are some exceptions to every rule, but my experience is people really want to work. They they just don't know. It's the dignity, and the uh, and the income. Uh, but uh, just to re-say it, it's as much sort of the dignity of being self-supporting as it is the income. And uh, so I, I I I I've always felt that the whole sort of incentive issue. I'm just giving you my personal sort of anecdotal inclination. The whole incentive issue is probably a little less important than it's made out to be by most by most economists. It's really about human beings wanting to be have their dignity, be self-supporting, make a contribution to society, uh, and 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 that kind of thing that it is in my view more important. But still having said that, uh, it is only fair that there be a, a you know, some return if people do make an effort and, and have some earnings. Hannah Bell. Thank you, Chair. Um, I had done quite a bit of work on the income clawback aspect of social assistance, and this was only changed last year after after some work here in the legislature because it was very challenging, very limited. Um, and so um, we had there are changes that took place um, in June of last year to um, increase the amount of money that, that, that people on social assistance can retain before those kind of clawback conditions kick in. And that includes things like child support payments, um, right. you know, that kind of money as well, which was, which was obviously a real challenge. But um, it was increased from, it was originally only um, $75 a month that you, the, that you could keep uh -huh. before it began you, to be called back. <laughs> yeah, so it's now up to $250 a month plus 30% yeah. of any additional over 250 And then there's all sorts of variations. The other piece that was also increased was um, how much in terms of liquid assets could be kept right. because right. previously... Um, social assistance clients were requ required to liquidate all of their assets. If they had anything like savings accounts or RSPs or anything like that, they had to liquidate all of them before they could become eligible. Um, so there has been some work done on that, but there, you know, those barriers are still there. And so I think it is a, it is a really important part of the consideration and understanding again that disincentive aspect. There's actually our conditional work 
actually is, is more of a disincentive to the overall conditions of the program uh, and uh, rather than the overall intent which is meant to be to help people enter the workforce should they wish to. Mr. Mendelson. Yeah, so uh, actually just on the assets issue in, in welfare, there's a, usually an assets limitation and people after a certain level of assets have to liquidate their uh, liquidate their assets and use that first. The amount of assets, I don't have the exact data, has been radically increased in several provinces, including in, in Ontario. And as far as I know, there's been no effect in Ontario on caseload. I think it went from, I don't know, I don't know, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but like from $5,000 to $20,000 and it didn't have any impact. Um, I, I, I was as an advocate involved in some of those discussions and, and you know, we challenged uh, the uh, Department of Finance many times uh, and uh, they brought forth data, but the, the truth was that now that it's been done and it's been a couple of years, it didn't seem to have any impact at all on enrollment. Um, so uh, my my you know my my personal experience is that for the most part, with a few exceptions, people don't want to be on social assistance if they can avoid it, and it is a last resort. Um, and it might be that we're worried about uh, putting in barriers a little more than we need to be. Annabelle, thank you, Chair. Yeah, the context here is you know a really. Um, relatively static number. I mean, you can look at the data all the way back, I think, to the 80s in the social assistance program in PEI, and it's been about 4,500 people. Um, it's still 4,500 people. It, it can plus and minus, depending on, on the seasonality and, and, you know, but, but like um, we heard from um, Dr. Forget that earlier today that, you know, the difference of a dollar doesn't make the difference of whether someone is in poverty or not. It, that, it's a very gray space of people yeah. needing to go in and out of social assistance. And, and, and um, the transition that we're seeing happening right now is more for people with disabilities because we have a new disability support program. They're still in social assistance. They're, just, they're in a different program within yeah, that yeah, same yeah. space. But the actual overall number of people in that envelope um, is, is um, you know, in that kind of uh, 3%. So it's it's three to four percent. So it's it's uh, there there the, we, the exemption that changed here was we went from five hundred dollars to three and a half thousand dollars, um, and again no impact on the numbers at this point. And we're over a year in. So so I think that that data again is again what question are we asking? What are we trying to collect? And then are we using the data that we have um, that can say well you know we did we made this move and nothing the world didn't end. So what else could we do? <laughs> Oh, I don't really. <laughs> I don't have this one. <laughs> uh, did we have any other questions? No. I don't okay, know. Uh, Mr. Mendelson, is there anything else you wanted to add before we sign off? Well, no. I just want to thank you for the opportunity to uh, to present uh, my report to you, and I hope uh, some of you've had a chance to read it. If anybody has any further questions of me, or if I can be of any other help to you, I I'd certainly be be very happy to to do so offer whatever I can. Good luck to you. Yes, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time today and it was incredibly helpful and informative. So thank you. All right. Okay. Goodbye. Okay. <laughs> yes. okay, great. Um, so uh, we had already uh, taken care of the other points on our agenda. So I guess is there anything else that uh, we need to talk about before we adjourn? Nope. Anybody want to move to adjourn? All right, Annabelle. Okay. We are adjourned.